This is Twit. Okay, so what happened after Coin Hive shut down? Aside from that, uh, as we previously discussed, and as I said at the top of the show, the highly controversial Coin Hive browser based Monero coin mining facility voluntarily closed its doors. Uh, actually, it was two months ago. I said a month ago. It was on March 8th, so it has been uh, uh, nearly two months. At the time, it was expected that the vacuum would quickly be filled with alternative mining solutions. So what has happened? Um, interestingly, the guy, uh, the head of threat intelligence at Malwarebytes, Jerome uh, Segura, decided to uh, answer that question and put up a blog posting at Malwarebytes titled Crypto Jacking in the Post Coin Hive Era. Uh, uh, and he wrote, September 2017 <coughs> is widely recognized as the month in which the phenomenon that became crypto jacking began. The idea that website owners could monetize their traffic by having visitors mine for cryptocurrencies in their browser was not new. But this time around, it became mainstream thanks to an entity known as CoinHive. He wrote, the mining service became a household name. And I was thinking, okay, I'm not sure whose house he's in, but you know, it wasn't a household. I'm not sure that CoinHive was a household name. But within certainly the, the uh, our little, our podcast listener community became a household name, he wrote, overnight and quickly drew ire for its original API whose implementation failed to take into account user approval and CPU consumption. As a result, threat actors were quick to abuse it by turning compromised websites and routers into a large illegal mining business. He writes, the ride was wild, but as we came to see, short-lived. As CoinHive shut its doors in March 2019, following months of steady decline and loss of interest in browser-based mining. And I'll interject here, as I said, that as we talked about at the time, it was largely a function of the general collapse in the cryptocurrency valuations from their highs of a few years before that, which did a lot to take the wind out of the market for monetizing the arguably stolen CPU cycles of innocent web users. Remember that the browsers responded and started fighting back and Things like uBlock Origin and and it and that the like. That's interesting. uBlock Origin did not block WebMine Pool because uh, I've got it running. It shows a block of something uh, on my browser, but not that. So, uh, and uh, uh, as I said at the time, and I and I say now, with user permission, with their with a user's knowledge, I think this is an interesting idea for monetizing. Uh, for some sites that do it responsibly and want to monetize the time that their users spend. Um, we've talked about ad blockers where we're seeing, you know, some pushback against them from time to time. You'll, you get a, a pop-up saying, I see you're using an ad blocker. Would you please consider supporting the site? Well, if, if, you know, using my processor while I'm rummaging around was an option, to, to give revenue to them that they sanctioned. It's like, okay, as long as everybody agrees. So anyway, um, uh, what the malware guys, what the malware bites guy wrote since they, what they have is they, they have a presence in many people's machines and they are doing real time traffic analysis in order to protect the machines. He wrote, interestingly, we still detect, Thousands of attempts for CoinHive related domain requests, even though the service announced it was shutting down on March 8th. Over the past week, our telemetry recorded an average of 50,000 attempts per day. Digging deeper, we see that a large number of websites and routers have never been cleaned, and the bits of, and of course, and the bits of JavaScript requesting the CoinHive library are still there. Evidently, with the service down, 
the necessary WebSocket that sends and receives data between client and server will fail to connect to the server, resulting in zero mining activity or gain. Yet, it's, you know, very much like, you know, Code Red and NIMDA. You know, you put a, a sensor out on the net, you still get Code Red and NIMDA pings because there are still some of those viruses, those worms, still alive trying to reproduce. Similarly, <coughs> it's going to be a long time before every router that has a resident copy of a coin hive miner in it gets rebooted and then doesn't get reloaded into RAM, uh, pr presuming that it wasn't made persistent. So this kind of stuff, the, the, these things have a very long tail before they finally go away. Uh, and for anyone who's interested, I have a picture of from February 27th through uh, the end of April. That it's relatively, you know, it's declining from its its peak, um, but, you know, it's sort of the dec decline looks like it's leveled off to like those things that are going to probably be around for a long time. And so he, he poses the question in his blog, is crypto jacking still a thing? He says, to answer that question, we go back to the early adopters of browser-based mining, which were torrent sites, visiting a proxy for the Pirate Bay with our browser, we spot something familiar enough. Our system CPU usage maxes out at 100%. So he writes, yeah, apparently in some corners of the web, crypto mining itself remains alive and well. He says, as we'll recall, this is what started the crypto jacking trend back in 2017 when users weren't told about this code running on their machine, let alone that it was hijacking their processor for maximum usage. In this instance, he writes, the mining API was provided by Crypto Loot, which was one of CoinHive's competitors at the time. Malwarebytes reports that while they're they are that while they are seeing nowhere near the same level of activity as they saw during the fall of 2017 and early 2018, according to their telemetry, they are still blocking more than one million requests to crypto loot each day. So that says there is still an effort by mining to to get its script loaded into people's systems for the purpose of mining. There are a few other services out there, and it's worth mentioning Coin IMP, which he writes that they've seen used more sensibly on file sharing sites. And he says router-based mining still going, while the number of compromised sites loading web miners was going down in 2018. A fresh opportunity presented itself thanks to serious vulnerabilities affecting microtick routers worldwide by injecting mining code from a route uh, from a router and serving it to any connected device behind it we talked about this in the past where for example if you were if you were behind an infected router and you went to an unencrypted landing page like your your ISP's DNS intercept where it said oh we don't you know the site you're looking for isn't available uh, brought to you by Cox, uh, how about some of these? That would immediately pin your your system CPU because the router you got that message through took advantage of the fact that the page you received was non-encrypted in order to insert its JavaScript into your page header. So he says, by injecting mining code from a router and serving it to any connected devices behind it, Criminals could finally scale the process so it was not limited to visiting a particular website, therefore generating decent revenues. On the other hand, they could only do this for any non-HTTPS page that the browser loaded. Once upon a time, 10 years ago, that would have been very lucrative. Now, not so much because pretty much everything is encrypted. 
He says the number of hacked routers running a miner has greatly decreased. However, today we can still find several hundred that are harboring the old in at now inactive coin hive code and have also been injecting a newer miner. Okay. So this brings us to webminepool.com, meaning that naturally it is being used for malicious purposes. Webminepool.com is now being injected into people's systems by compromised routers. And so anyway, he concludes with campaigns gone missing. Perhaps the biggest change in crypto jacking related activity is the lack of new attacks and campaigns in the wild targeting vulnerable websites. He says, for example, in the spring of 2018, we saw waves of attacks against Drupal sites where web miners were one of the primary payloads. And in fact, we've addressed the observation that that's changing now uh, uh, previously. He says, these days, hacked sites are leveraged in various traffic monetization schemes that include browser locks, fade up, fake updates, and malvertising. If the content management system is Magneto or another e-commerce platform, the primary payload is going to be a web skimmer. Of course, and you know we know that those are trying to obtain uh, the user's credit card information as it's submitted to a to a monetization to a, a, a an e-commerce site. He says we might compare crypto jacking to a gold rush that didn't last too long, as criminals sought more rewarding opportunities. However, we wouldn't call we wouldn't rush to call it fully extinct. We can certainly expect web miners to stick around, especially for sites that generate a lot of traffic. Indeed, miners can provide an additional revenue stream that is, as concluded in this virus bulletin paper, and they have a link to it, that says, quote, dependent on various factors, including, of course, the value of cryptocurrencies, which historically has been volatile. So I think that's where we are. The coin hive died. That was the preeminent crypto mining tool. Um, everybody was using it. There were also RANs. They now have a larger share. Uh, and then there's this web pine mo web mine pool, which you guys in your network, Leo, you're probably glad or unable to access yes. thanks to your protection. Um, uh, it's alive and well. So I think just like all of the worms that have existed in the past, the, the malware that's out there, there is, there's like a, a, a place for and a diminishing presence of crypto jacking. It's never going to go away. It'll sort of fade into the past. Uh, it doesn't make the money that it once did. So they're just there, you know, the, the world has moved to things like, uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the ransomware in order to uh, attempt to get into people's systems and, and extort money. So anyway, sort of a, a, a podcast all about web browsers this week, just as a consequence of how much browser stuff is in the news. And of course, we know that it makes sense for us to talk about that because that is the surface that we visit the internet via. It's, it is the attack surface that we expose. So we've well, got to keep our browsers secure. It's better than spending every week talking about Adobe Reader. So that's <laughs> Yeah, there so has been it. some drift, hasn't there? <laughs> There's been some a little drift. drift.